It was the 1960s and the United States was erupting. The war in Vietnam and the protests that followed became a black cloud over a divided nation. The country was rocked by the assassinations of Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy. The civil rights movement was charged with a new energy and anger and women were demanding their equal rights. The culture was also going through a revolution. For many, it was a time of make love, not war, of turn on, tune in and drop out, of flower power. The music scene at the time reflected and amplified this revolution. In 1969, half a million strong descended on Yazger's farm at Woodstock in upstate New York, and countless hippies were flooding the Haight-Ashbury district of San Francisco. In the late 60s, the whole earth took on a whole new perspective. 158 miles south of the Haight was the Esalen Institute in Big Sur, which had been founded by Michael Murphy and Dick Price in 1962. By the late 60s, Esalen was known as the global mecca for the human potential movement. It attracted avant-garde thinkers such as Aldous Huxley, Abraham Maslow, Anna Halperin, Ida Rolf, Baba Ramdas, and Timothy Leary. Fritz Perls led Gestalt workshops. It was also a place for Joan Baez, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, George Harrison and Ravi Shankar to perform, as well as retreat and recharge. In addition to its many psychological, artistic, and spiritual workshops, Esalen was becoming known for its unique form of healing massage. Hi, I'm Ken Dykewald. I'm a husband, a father, a brother, an employer, psychologist, gerontologist, documentary filmmaker, CEO of AgeWave, and I'm the author of 19 books. I'm a former Esalen Institute student and then teacher. And over the past 50 plus years, I've been a long time friend of the community and supporter of the organization. I was asked if I would help capture the legacy stories and lessons from the four very special women who initially co-created and for the past 50 years have shaped and taught the excellent style of massage and body work. These wonderful women, Peggy Huran, Deborah Meadow, Brita Ostrom and Vicki Topp, while very different from one another, are the living masters of this special form of healing art. They've trained thousands of practitioners who in turn have collectively worked on several million people throughout the world. I invite you to listen to their stories. Get a sense as to what brought them to Big Sur in the first place, how they shaped what has now become a, an art form, a healing art form practiced all over the world. What are the kinds of thoughts and influences that have impacted the way they do the work they do? Enjoy these sessions. I grew up in Larchmont, New York. It was very suburban. It was very straight. Um, that's me, probably 16, 17 years old. This is our wedding. Dick and I got married at the barn. We had a total wild hippie wedding. That's Dick and myself and Jasmine on my right and Lucia sitting next to Dick coming from New York City to Big Sur, California in 1967 was, I, I often say I felt like Alice in Wonderland. Like I'd just gone down the rabbit hole into this amazing new reality and um, I was captured. Uh, this is my place. I was an imaginal child. In fact, I had imaginary friends. And those are my dolls. That is uh, taken in 1972. Gosh, that was such a happy day. I was busy falling in love. And I heard about Esalen on a radio show with Alan Watts. I thought, wow, that sounds really, really good. I was interested in community. And the first chance I got, I headed north hitchhiking with a friend. My granddaughter has on the little pink hat. She's the short one. My daughter, Ivy, was delivered. but She was Peggy's first delivery, and Peggy went on and became a midwife. Well, also then, there's the wonderful, sensual world that Esalen opens up. I mean, it's unbeatable, and there's a lot of exhilaration. I feel like climbing to the top of the mountain instead of just looking up at it through binoculars. It's really that difference. That was a school picture taken in South Bend, Indiana, and I was about nine years old. I was a little kid who liked to run around and climb trees and try to follow my older brothers. 
I was a town girl and I hitchhiked from Rio Road to Esalen and I never been on the West Coast and I fell in love with the coast and then they dropped me off at Esalen and as I was walking down the hill I just went wow this feels like home. What was it like to raise two young women in Big Sur in the human potential movement? Both girls were very social <clears throat> and so they met lots of people at Esalen and they charmed the seminarians. The seminarians loved them. But then there's this history of what's been on that land, the Native Americans that were there before we were there. And that also means there's a responsibility for whoever is on that land to caretake and listen and bless that land. We always had animals, Texas, South Texas. And uh, so we had all these cats around. We always have had cats around because there was always, we were feeding them. I graduated from high school early, college early, and was on my way to law school. But I didn't have to be in law school until the fall. That's how I ended up at Esalen. That's my son, Stephen. And uh, that photo was taken on a day when we had reconnected after a long time. We have been so lucky to have lived in this period of time. And that I just have gratefulness and appreciation for Esalen and for Mike and uh, Dick's vision of creating a place for that to happen. How would you describe Esalen? Like, what is Esalen? If somebody maybe never been there, never heard of it, what is Esalen? Oh, geez, Ken, what kind of question is that? Vague. Esalen is a place where people come to change their lives, to find themselves, to find something different in themselves, to expand, to get rejuvenated, to do something different, to make a change. Think of Esalen as the land. I think that's part of the thing that it affects people. And being that close to the ocean, having the mountains, the creek running down through there, the hot water bubbling up, that edge, and then you've got big sky with everything from clouds and condors and everything else. And I think that, I think the environment has been one of the biggest pieces of Esalen. People came to Esalen for the craziest reasons. A lot of them came for the workshop. Those were people because big time psychologists were coming through with really new ideas as well as other people, people who were really mixing it up and, and recognizing the value of personal experience in anything, in any kind of artistic expression or growth. Also coming were the people who saw Esalen as, as a free spirit place. I think no matter what is happening at Esalen or how cutting edge it is, I think that the idea that there is an Esalen is really one of the biggest parts of, of Esalen, that there is a place where I can go and I can retreat and I can put the world aside and be part of a larger, more natural world. How would you describe Esalen's purpose in the world? Um, Esalen is a retreat center. Um, it's an educational retreat center. So it's a place for people to go and, as I did, really discover oneself. Um, there's lots of support for deep, deep uh, searching, contemplation, uh, developing body, mind, and spirit. It's a sacred land. It's been used for healing for years, years before we got there. When the indigenous people, the Esalen Indians were there, it was a healing center and it still is. And healing happens in many ways for different people. Um, but that's how I would describe it, a retreat center that's, that's a healing educational place of beauty and magnificence, really. Most massage forms at that point in this country were a parts model. Working with this, working with the shoulder, that's what you work with. And with the sense of working with the body as a whole. And I think that came together in that, that sensing and allowed that also the gestalt piece of working with someone, facilitating for someone. 
So I'm not going to take you. I'm not going to do you. I'm going to work with you. So when I teach, I talk about what I call four elements of Esalen massage. So it's not just coming in and with a program and doing this or that with someone. You're working with someone. And so in order for that to happen, the second premise, I think, is that it is a meditative experience. That meditative quality of presence, I think, allows people to drop into a deeper state inside themselves uh, where different things can happen. So for me, that's a third premise, that we may be affecting our clients or people on more than the physical, on the mental, the emotional, the spiritual, on all levels. And then the fourth thing that I would say are those long integrating strokes that give people a sense of their wholeness, that move people from when you're giving a massage from one area of the body to another and keep it all connected. So there's this flow that's happening on a deep way on a physical level between the different parts of the body and somehow that deep meditative presence and deep contact allows people to drop into deeper states inside themselves. It's a, a presence-based awareness practice that encourages self-healing. Um, by that, I mean presence-based in that the practitioner is fully present we are uh, centered and grounded when we come to, our, to meet our clients and um, we are relaxed. Our nervous system is, is in um, a calm space and we hope that that will resonate with our client. So as we do our work, the space that we're in, of course, influences how our client feels. And if we're grounded and relaxed and present, that, that, they pick that up from us. And when they finish the massage and they thank you, and that was so wonderful. And, and what they're really thanking us for is that we're, we help them to connect to themselves. It's not about what we did. It's about how they received it and what happened for them. So um, yeah, there's a lot to it. Now, here we've got this retreat environment. People like Algis Huxley, Tim Leary, Hunter Thompson, Abe Maslow, the founders, Michael Murphy and Dick Price. But this massage thing came to be. How come? There was a lot going on at that time. Dick and Mike had created this, this place that they wanted to explore the human mind and the potential of the human mind. And they were drawing in all kinds of people from Eastern and Western tradition. And they wanted to have something because they were learning that the mind and body are not separate. They are together. And so they wanted to bring in some somatic work, something that joined the mind and body, a massage that integrated mind and body, that helped people feel their wholeness and the, the influence of mind, body, spirit, emotion, how it's all one thing and it's not just the mind up here and the body down here and emotions over here. And well, we were all taking workshops and I'd say combination of the influence of the, of the environment being down there, but we were all moving, but Charlotte Selver doing the sensory awareness and the sensing all the gestalt, working with Fritz and with everybody else, working with the person as a whole. A massage was happening when I first got to Esalen. So I'm not sure where the day it began, but I know that the uh, one of the people responsible for it originally was a woman named Molly Day Shackman, who had a, a practice in Swedish massage. Swedish massage was very popular, you know, that kind of and Swedish massage is about circulation, it's about health, but when you took that massage and you melded it with something smoother and softer and better feeling, um, and people noticed that, wow, this is relaxing, I don't need somebody to beat me up, um, that, that really changed massage. And the person who was doing Swedish massage, of course, was Molly Day Shackman. She was just one of those people who was very curious. You know, some people go, they learn this and then they learn that and they meld it together. And that was really her. When she would teach a move, she would go, oh, and I just learned this move last week, this little pinching the finger. Or <laughs> she was endlessly adding things to massage. She was really integrating this vast 
a practice of body work that was just barely emergent at the time. There was a lot of emphasis on sensing the body, on feeling the body, on not denying the body and closing it down, but really discovering the lessons that the body holds and, and the beauty. And, and massage was sort of part of that. It was helping people sort of return home to their physical bodies. And um, it, it really grew out of the many influences that were and the practices that were going on at the time, um, the Gestalt therapy, which emphasized the here and now, the Buddhist work of Alan Watts, again, here in the present moment, the work of Charlotte, sensory awareness, and then the, the Tai Chi masters who were there that sort of taught us all how to move in this beautiful flowing way. And we had the ocean to orchestrate that for us. And so we had uh, many, many important things that were happening at Esalen fed into our, the development of what we did. And the massage went from a Swedish massage into a very slow and sensual type of work. Did you guys all sit in a room and say, this is what the massage is going to be? Or did it just sort of evolve somehow? I think it just started evolving, like doing jazz improvisation. Hmm. I hmm. know, it's just like the drummers and the music taking off on one another and then the other. And that was the same thing down at the bats. Because you'd look over and you go, oh, that's interesting. What would happen if I did that with someone? Or, oh, can I do that? Or someone else? And even more important, I keep mentioning the environmental influences, you know, whether it's the condors flying over and all of a sudden you're working with someone in that way. Yeah, there was also a time, Vic, my memory serves me right, where not only were you guys down at the baths dreaming up and evolving this form of massage, mm -hmm. But Ida Rolf was coming through and Moshe Feldenkrais was right. doing some stuff. And you mentioned <laughs> Fritz Perls and Dick Price. And then Milton Traeger kind of wandered in with his style. Oh, and Milton and Traeger, overnight, things changed. People were moving bodies in a different way. It was amazing watching that just happen so fast. How did you react when there were new insights or lessons regarding any of this? I am so lucky that I was the model for most of them at some point in time. I don't know what it was, but I got to be their model. And when Ida came, she totally influenced the way I do yoga. And she would give me a few suggestions and I would do the asana again. And he would take pictures before and after. She brought in the lines of yoga. I mean, of rolfing, like keep your waistline back, don't lock your knees or your elbows, different things like that. Then I would do the posture, oh, and keep your head in alignment with your spine. So in yoga, many people throw the head back and, and compress the vertebrae. Nope, you keep the head in alignment with the spine when you're doing a lot of those postures. It totally influenced what I did. After I did that yoga, she said to me, yoga is the best form of physical exercise when it's done correctly. And of course, when it's done correctly meant when it's done according to her lines of rolfing. So for the early decades of massage at Esalen, uh, there was no draping required or usually asked for. So the person getting the massage was nude, but the massage practitioner was nude also for decades. And people could think, oh, that's because it must have been a sexy thing. It wasn't about sexy. It was about caring and touch and natural. What's your recollection of the nude decades as a therapist, as a massage therapist? Well, you know, for me from New York City, it was pretty shocking to first get there and take off all my clothes and get into the tub with people. But I got over it quickly. And and um, and yeah, it was just natural. I mean, at that time, people were shedding inhibitions. That was part of the 60s and part of the movement and clothes were people were taking off their clothes. And, and so there was this whole movement to accept our bodies, accept the beauty of the naked body, to not be ashamed, um, you know, all of that. And um, when we, because we worked at the baths, we would go and take our client, we'd meet them in the tub, and bring a towel, and we'd all be naked. Everybody in the baths would be naked. So it wasn't as we 
sounds because it was a total naked environment. Um, and But then we would go into the massage room or up on the deck or wherever we were working with the client and um, we didn't dress. And that, that was just part of the culture. And um, people got used to it. A lot of people, if, if they were uncomfortable with it, then they would probably not come to the baths. But most, most people felt it was a, it was a growing and, and freedom for them to experience themselves and everybody else that way. There was a psychedelic era that has come alive and quieted and come alive and quieted. What role did psychedelics play in the giving or receiving of massage back in the day? I think psychedelics really woke us up to our senses and the potential of our senses. And we were busy feeling leaves and we were busy noticing beautiful fabrics and the sunset was jaw dropping. <laughs> and psychedelics also, we were able to climb inside our body. So we were really able to work with a massage practitioner. I think psychedelics were a very large part of the formation of body awareness and appreciation of massage. And certainly when you're giving a massage, not that you would give one stoned, but just that you were now had that enlivened consciousness of, of sensory. Big, big piece. If you were the boss of all things, uh, and you were to see to it that the Esalen massage would change or evolve in certain ways in the years to come, what would you like to see it be more of? Well, I, I think it's really important that we keep an open mind to to new new possibilities. I mean, it really has developed over the years, but a lot of other influences, other types of body work have influenced our work, um, Traeger work and rolfing and deep tissue and, and shiatsu. I mean, all the different forms. So I think it's important that we stay open to whatever new or old art forms come back into our field so that we can continue to incorporate pieces that work for us um, from different, different practices. So I think an open-mindedness for change because change is inevitable, right? So I think that's important. Here you are as a young woman doing the body work. Uh, what pulled you into the touch field versus dance or movement or law or philosophy or anthropology? What was it that drew you towards touch? I have to admit it's consistently been one of, if not my favorite form of meditation. There's something well, about working with people. And that was the early piece of Esalen massage that's been so powerful, I think, to ripple out uh, with other people. It's not a, a technique or a protocol or things like that. It's like, how are we going to connect, Ken? I've worked with you enough. You know that. I go, well, what's going on and where should we start and what should we, you know, where are we going from here? But I think we're afraid of the power of simple contact and touch. But the, the real just lingering touch and being present with somebody without words, with contact, it's such a deep experience. It's intimate. It felt very natural to me. It, it was just one of those things that the, fir the first time I, well, I was enthralled by receiving massage, of course. I had never been touched in that way, you know, that, that kind of loving care that, that comes with the Esalen massage was so wonderful. And the first time I gave a massage in a class, it felt completely natural to me. It felt like a beautiful way for me to express love and to, and to express caring. And I mean, my nature has always been to be a caring person. So it, it just kind of grew naturally out of who I am. It was not only the expression, but it was something physical. You know, it wasn't, I wasn't sitting, I was moving, I was dancing, I was, there was movement in the work. So I love that about it too. And um, it, it just called me. Yeah, it was, that's how it happened. So you've been a part of Esalen and all these additional realms and worlds. You could think of the three or four most wonderful teachers or beings characters that have kind of been a part of your dance. Uh, who comes to mind? Dick Price. He was a mentor for me. 
when I was doing four hours of yoga a day, sometimes I would go into room 23. And one day he walked through and he said, I think you're ready. And I said, ready? He said, yeah, you're, it's time. You can teach a massage movement and yoga workshop. And that's how I got my first workshop. And also I studied Gestalt with him and I learned so much from him and how to be present. And I learned a lot on how to listen and be present without having to interject. Of course, I have to mention Gabrielle. How could mm. I not? Because she was my first massage teacher. I had some <laughs> great experiences with her. Her presence influenced me. She gave me more permission to be even more of who I am. The first one is Seymour Carter because he, he was in all of these fields. He was cathartic in the bodywork field where people needed to let it all out. And then he was psychologically, what's your thumb doing now? Um, in his gestalt work, what's your thumb want to do? Um, speak as your thumb. Um, so I'm going to mention Seymour. And, and because he was so willing to, to uh, really study what it was like to be a rebel. Uh, Seymour Carter, he definitely influenced my work. He was also a student of Charlotte Silver, a sensory awareness. He had an incredibly sensitive touch. And, you know, back in the 60s, men were not allowing their feminine side. Men were macho. Men were the boss. You know, men were, it was a patriarchal world. And there was something about Seymour that uh, allowed a softness to come through to, through him. And he was one of my first teachers. And I, I, I love that about him. I, you know, if I may quote another of my teachers, Alyssa Lodge. The body is revolutionary. Acknowledging the body is revolutionary. We all spent our youth ignoring the body. Um, you were supposed to march through sickness, show up in school, none of this namby-pamby, stay home when you have a symptom. Um, the body was something that was here and was to be controlled. And that certainly went with sexuality. And then in the 60s, suddenly people were saying, you know, the reports in the 50s, the importance of orgasm and sex. And then here comes massage, which acknowledges the body. So, Brie, you're, you're in the middle of all this. Mm -hmm. Alyssa Lodge, Charlotte Silver. But then there's Ida Rolf showing up and there's Will Schutz showing up. And there's uh, the work of Wilhelm Reich showing up through Al Lowen and John Paracas and Stanley Kellerman. And there's, I may I mentioned Moshe Feldenkrais, but then Milton Traeger shows up and, and Al Huang is teaching his movement in Tai Chi. How did these different teachers impact the Esalen massage, in your opinion? Well, I, I think we could take and, and uh, talk at length about the impact of each of those people on Esalen Massage. The overall impact was that here was something really cool, the body. And that what I, I had agency in the body. I had agency over my health. Currently, I've been working with Bonnie Bainbridge Cohen for the last 20, 30 years. Being with that somatic crowd has really challenged and enlivened and influenced whatever I've been doing. I don't think I would have evolved with Bonnie so quickly if I hadn't been working with Emily Conrad. Being with Emily was permission in a way to just drop way deep inside into that subtle, whether it was breath or pulsation, and then work evolving from the inside out. Wow. And that made a big difference, especially in my work, because uh, I'd say up until then, I was still working more, you know, coming in, working with you from the outside in. I was still, you know, making contact, but suddenly more the influence of where it's, what's on your inside and how to bring that more fully out and how that influences what's on your outside. What do you think are your personal major contributions to the world of healing massage? Yeah, I, I think a really grounded presence um, and, and an open-heartedness, you know, empathy, compassion, 
you know, when I'm with somebody, I'm really, I'm really with them. And uh, that makes a huge difference. Many of us have had treatment elsewhere and it can be mechanical and, and that's just not the way we work. You know, there's a sensitivity and a consciousness that we bring to the practice that's so much bigger and uh, encompasses so much more than, uh, than technique. Or... I want to know, were you aware back in the 70s and 80s that your yoga knowledge was working itself out through your practice? I think moving and exploring my own body and how it could move and how it could progress to not stretch, but extend, listening and allowing. Yoga is about listening to and finding where I am, listening to where I am, and then exploring that edge in a gentle way. Force creates more stress. It's the same thing with body work. If I go in and I force something, maybe it'll move. But is it going to stay that way? Is it going to make the muscles sore so they kind of contract again because that was too hard? And when I work with someone, especially if I do it over time, I'm exploring their tissue with them. And then they can relax and see where they are. And then they can explore a little bit with extending without push. And that is super important to me. And so the yoga really helped me learn about my own body and then gave me an idea of how it might be in other people's bodies in tissue and how I might explore and play with their tissue, almost like the way I did with my own. So you've been trained and, and have a practice as a psychotherapist in addition to this. What struck me when I was a young man was how when Freud was crafting his model, he paid no attention to the body, really. Other, you know, he would sort of look the other way. You'd be lying on a couch and he'd be taking notes. And then it was Reich and Jung and Fritz Perls who began to say, wait a minute, there's a body side of the mind and they're all, they're interacting with each other. How can psychology benefit from a deeper recognition of what you've learned in, as a body work practitioner? Most psychologists don't pay that much attention to a person's relationship to their body. You know, when you're just paying attention to the words as a psychologist, you're only getting about a third of the picture. There's a whole lot of other information coming in. And a psychologist, many psychologists, the, the really good ones, are paying attention to that information coming in. Um, but they're not doing it in a way that also reflect, allows or uh, encourages the client to pay attention to that information coming in. So the client won't notice that they're holding their breath. The, the person, facil the facilitator will, might say, uh, have you noticed you've been holding your breath since you brought this topic up or you haven't been breathing as deeply? Um, but he might just make a kind of mental note of that, but not involve the client. I, I do think the embodied work gives so much more agency to the client to, to, to do this deep excavation process of uh, leading to, toward one's freedom. I've always thought when you've worked on me that you had this profound level of intuition that I didn't, almost didn't ever have to say anything and somehow you would know where I was hurting. I do feel that my intuition is what's guided me in my life and that doors, I simply see the, the door open and I walk through it. I've trusted my intuition to get there. Um, but really, Ken, intuition is not a sixth sense particularly. It's a recognizing the five senses and paying attention to them. Uh, so, for example, when I'm working on you, I will notice this and I will notice this and I'll remember what you said and I'll also remember your tone of voice. You've given it to me already, but I had to receive it. That's, that's the piece that's intuition, to receive what you're being given. I have known and been worked on by many, many body workers and massage therapists and healers in my life. But I have to say that you almost stand in a category unto yourself, Vic. Your strength and precision and knowledge of how it all works and who I am as a person is extraordinary. What are you most 
aware of is your gift. I mean, is it your knowledge? Is it your meditation? Is it your strength? Is it your resilience? What is your gift? I feel that in this lifetime, I needed to touch in on a lot of people to heal some wounds that maybe I was responsible for causing in an earlier part of their evolution. I've felt strongly about this. Yeah. So you feel that partly what you're doing is reconciling or working through yep. some of your own story through the work? My own story that goes maybe way back. Mm. I don't know that you know this. Um, I'm a war orphan. Didn't know My that. My dad died uh, when I was 12, 13, during the early Vietnam part. Uh, he was on active duty, and so that's why I got um, my college paid for and things like that. Anyway, okay. that's part of, I think, was a big part of me doing this work. It's also a very Gurdjieffian concept. I remember uh, one of my friends who was very involved with Gurdjieff telling me this, you know, that we have a certain amount of giving back from clearing our past There are workshops to teach people how to give a massage. Mm -hmm. But I wonder if you'd share three or four pieces of advice for somebody getting a massage. What, how does one best receive a massage for it to have its ultimate impact? In the beginning, communicate with the person you're, that's working with you and see if you can have a resonance. I know I've gotten massages and I take a moment and really see if we can connect because I think yes. that's important in Esalen massage mm -hmm. because I wanna be hooked in with you as Milton Traeger used to call it hookup. And I think that's important when you're receiving is for you to walk in and take a moment and let them see who you are what other advice would you give to somebody getting a massage, the Nestlein massage? Take a deep breath, let yourself be supported by the table and allow yourself just to see what is going to come up for you in the session. Just surrender as much as possible, but also take responsibility for yourself. If something doesn't feel right, if it hurts, let your person know what if something isn't doesn't feel right and as well going yes that feels wonderful mm. that feel oh oh gosh i forgot i was having headaches and what you're doing is just exactly right mm. draw them into what you need take some responsibility for getting what you need i would encourage that person to stay with their breath to be open to receive and to really take control over your own body in the sense that if something is not feeling right to you as the client, that you let your practitioner know that right away. If the pressure is too much, if the pressure is too little, if you don't like the stretches, whatever is happening for you, you are the master of your own body and you are in control of this session. So please give us feedback if, if you need to. I think the most important thing is when you show up and you're actually on the massage table, close the door to your the rest of your day. <laughs> Allow yourself that freedom, that space to just be there for the massage. And, and, and know that you can come back to those thoughts. You can go ahead and worry about the company going under when the massage is over. But for right now, it's to provide an opportunity to drop into you, knowing that a whole fresh new attitude might change everything on that financial sheet. The next most important thing is to be willing to feel. And for so many people, they come in and the first massage, they sleep right through it. Then the third thing I would say is allow the massage to settle at the end. Allow yourself to really feel the massage when it hurts. Some of those muscles 
are going to be really old, old, old patterns of holding. And even contacting them with a little pressure is going to be almost an ouch, not quite. And you can say that's too much pressure, but keep your attention there. Keep your attention there. Ask your, if it's too much, by all means, let your practitioner know. The first thing I'm going to say is a little, it's a little more basic to let yourself be like a rag doll, not <laughs> helping, not resisting, just allowing. Know that you might be affected on the more than the mental or the emotional or physical level, and that's perfectly okay. And sometimes emotions come up and sometimes they don't, and that's okay too. And then also, sometimes you might drop into a very deep place, and that's a lovely place to be, and it might even feel like sleeping, and that's also okay. When I get massage or body work, I feel like I'm in there in the dance. So if it's my shoulder that's being worked on, I'm mindfully and consciously, as in my yoga practice, trying to let go and let the practitioner go as deep as possible. Or if I'm clenching my hips or my feet, I try to be present. You're an educated receiver. Say more about that. Being an educated receiver means that you've received massages before and you probably know what you want out of your massage. And so you're more willing to go in there in your mind and work with the tissue with the practitioner. Not everybody can do that. But what I would say to you is see if you could not work with it. See if you could play with it. How about oh, instead oh, of hey. making it, how about softening the tissue? How about bringing an element of play in instead of work? I got to make this relax. It's never going to let go. How about, oh, what would it feel like if I could soften this tissue? Let's bring that into the massage. I tell clients that I don't, I, I'm trying to move away from the word try and the word work and move into play, explore, soften because all those words bring attention in with them. And I don't want tension in there. I want to see if you can let go. Clearly, as you mentioned, and as you describe, and for those watching this who've never been to Esalen, it is a property unlike any other property on earth. Waterfalls, cliffs, dolphins breaching, galaxies bristling at night. Um, and these so natural hot sulfur springs baths surrounding the region where the massage rooms and tables are set up. What's your thought about people who would think about getting an Esalen massage someplace else? They can have the, the a wonderful experience someplace else. It's it's different. It doesn't include all that, of course. But but you know when you close your eyes and you're on a table, maybe some of that isn't so important. You know. Um, of course, I encourage people to come because it's a wonderful experience, but I think you can experience an Esalen massage anywhere in the world. You just need a quiet kind of sacred space created for you and the presence of somebody who can give that. So we, we actually have practice people all over the world doing Esalen massage now. I think there's some fabulous body work and things going on all over the world right now. And I think other environments bring in other things. When I think of teaching in Bali or Brazil or even Switzerland, I remember coming out of an intro group in a little room in Germany somewhere. And it wasn't even a great space, you know? And we'd done a weekend workshop and the guy looking at me and he says, you know, I've been at Esalen a lot. I didn't think you could do it, but I just walked out feeling like I'd been at Esalen. Wow. And I think there's other places that bring in influences, like teaching in Brazil with all the animals around, the monkeys in the trees, literally, mm. you know, or paying mm -hmm. attention to the animal spirits. What do we bring from what we have gotten in our collective experiences? To what extent do you feel that you're also orchestrating the sound of the waves and uh, the porpoises and uh, the whales that occasionally breach and, and uh, the sunlight? I mean, versus doing a massage in a hotel 
somewhere without all of that wonderful ambiance. Well, I have to say the ambiance you just described certainly influences. There's so much, it's so, there's so much water sound. The ocean is splashing, the tubs are doing whatever they're doing if you're working in certain places. Um, and the air is so wonderful and you've just spent this time in this green world and it's not crowded. Um, so yes, that ambience certainly counts. But I have given massages on the 13th floor in Hiroshima. And uh, the woman there, the Esalen practitioner, she walked in. Well, obviously she's on an office. She can't have a thing, but she did a foot bath and talked to the person while she gently massaged their feet. And then they lay on the table. She had a beautiful flower here and a beautiful flower there. And her curtain was pulled just a little bit so you could see the flow of light changing. And it was still very much an awareness that this is a natural world and you and I are part of it. So much of the environment is about keeping the stimulation down, that really allowing myself or the massage per person being massaged, that's, that's who it's happening to. There's not music that's particularly rhythmic. It's, it's just sort of very soft if there's music. And, and it's an opportunity to focus on me. The, the background is not going to be intrusive. Does someone have to be at Esalen to have a deep experience getting an Esalen massage? Of course not. You know, you and I were, did workshops in Aarhus, Denmark together, and you were in North. There's no ocean lapping beside the baths, and there's no hot tubs right there. So how, do, how does that experience translate into other places? It has to do with quality of presence. If I bring a full-hearted quality of presence to what I do, and I drop into a deep state of committed presence and listening presence with the person that I'm massaging, then that creates a place where they can also drop in. Sometimes there are challenges when there are noisy, car noise, even if you have some other stuff, like if you're playing music or something, or distractions or phone ringings, or even though we try to create the best space, it doesn't always happen. I've had people just drop deeply into place. It has to do with the practitioner and who and how they are in that moment in time with their client. So occasionally people refer to what goes on as body work. Some people refer to it as massage. Some people refer to it as a healing art. What do you prefer? I prefer massage, especially at this point in my life. I've, I've had some injuries. And what has helped me the most are things that put me back into my body in a pleasurable way. Because in an injury, we're doing everything we can to not pay attention. But um, a massage allows me to notice it. But there's something about the pace and the rhythm that adds, re, I regain that sense of pleasure in the body, or at least of well-being, of feeling okay that I have this piece. And I have this piece that's sore, and that's, that's what's happening. It also allows me to acknowledge what's real as opposed to what I'm trying to pretend isn't there. Well, what's on my card is somatic touch and movement. Uh, mostly because I want to really acknowledge and honor the somatic teachers and practitioners and evolution within that. And so Don Johnson wrote a great book on um, bones, breath and gesture, I think is the name bones. Mm -hmm. And he interviewed all of these old and history of the evolution of the somatic world. And I've been blessed. I read through there and I work with almost all of those or one of their students. And that was just amazing. And when I was teaching in Europe to help them to go back, reclaim their own legacy. And I think that's one of the things Esalen Massage has done as we've spread out into the world is really supporting people to reclaim who they are from the inside, from the time they're a single cell emerging out or their historical legacy of evolution in their culture. 
I do not like it when people call themselves healers. I don't like that word. I don't think we are healers. Hopefully we can help people come into a place where they can heal themselves. 50 years is a long time to be doing anything. What have you learned about how to stay motivated? I love helping people learn how to listen and how to feel and how to explore themselves and being with someone else's body and how to be present. It is fun, exciting, meaningful, because if I can help somebody learn how to touch somebody with love and presence and comfort and help someone feel more comfortable in their body, then they're going to do that for themselves and someone else. And then when I teach them, they're going to go out and touch other people. It's just a, a drop in a pond and the ripples go out. I still love touching people. It is an exploration. There's always something new to learn. And I have learned some really deep things from people I've worked with. I can see how somebody would say, I want to do body work or somatic healing and touch for a year or two. That's all I ever thought I'd do it for. But here you've been doing it for 50 plus years. Mm-hmm. How is it you've been, what drives you to keep going? It's my favorite form of meditation. It works for me. When I'm touching someone else, I'm also being touched myself. And when I drop into that space, of resonance or meditation with you, there's a dialogue. Here's something I can do. I can give it to you. It can make you can feel better. And from there, the people you relate to can feel better. And I really do think that touch and massage can change the world. What it gives me is is great pleasure. I'm still fascinated by the work. Um, It's I'm always learning. I'm always challenged. Each client to me is new. I have to recreate myself in that moment and them in that moment and be able to work with whatever comes to me. And it's also, you know, in some ways, I think made me a more compassionate person in that, um, you know, each person who ends up on the table, you, you end up loving in a way. What do you feel in terms of your craft, your art, your work, what do you feel is the greatest contribution you've made? Well, my students call me Sneaky Deep. Sneaky Deep? Never heard that before. Why do they say that? When I work with people, I like to ease my way into where your tissue lets me go. And then I like to drop in further and go in as deeply as it's comfortable for the tissue and you and me. That is a contribution I'm proud of. And there's another, it's humor. When I teach, we have fun. And so I think it's really important to have humor be part of the learning process. In your career, what is it you're most proud of? I'm pretty proud that I'm still moving and as healthy as I am. I feel like I'm a product of my environment. And I'm proud of that, of being smart enough to have put myself in a situation where I could evolve to where I am. It's both most proud of, and sometimes I'm going, oh my God, I should have stayed in law school. I'm proud of the massage school, that we've allowed so many of our students to find a meaningful life path that's legitimate. I'm really proud of that. So you have taught thousands of people who have given thousands of massages There are millions of people out there whose lives are being touched by what emanates from you. Well, I I don't really think about it. um, But but when I do, when it's mentioned, like you're mentioning it now, yeah, it's it's wonderful. I mean, you know, we can change the world if we can get people to touch each other and love each other and and be kind to each other. So it does amaze me that that things have gone this far in 50 years. and we'd like to see it go further. I mean, you know, it's when, when there's a healing practice that works and when people can learn to touch each other in this way, um, it, needs to, it needs to be spread. 
I want you to imagine it's decades and decades from now. I'm gone. You're gone. We're all, all people we know of our era are gone. What is it you'd like for people to remember about you? If they were to say Deborah Meadows, she was. Uh, someone who loved. Wow. There's so many things that come in. Love to help other people. I love to dance and sing and move and be fully in her body and really helped love to help other people enjoy being in their being in their whole being. So that means body, mind, spirit, emotion. And even if we don't love each other, at least respect and treat each other with kindness. Kindness cannot be overrated ever. Honesty and kindness. How would you like for people to remember you if they were to say Vicky Top, she was generous and kind, kind. What is it you want people to remember about Brita Ostrom? What do you want them to say? Brita, she was. <laughs> she was kind. She was really too to throw a lot of things out and take a lot of new things in. So here are these four women who I have the honor of knowing for over 50 years. What would you tell us about this foursome? Geez, knowing somebody for over 50 years is pretty amazing. And being involved in a, I guess you could call it an ongoing project for all these years <laughs> is pretty amazing. We support each other. We fight with each other. We be with each other. I think we've all learned a lot with each other. We are like sisters. Well, let me say that um, I have such admiration and respect for you and, um, and love for you over all these decades. And I'm honored to uh, have been given this chance to interview you for these legacy sessions. Uh, the feeling is mutual. <laughs> I have so much love and respect and honor for you and what you have accomplished with your life for the, through the years. Thank you. Thank you, Ken, for all that you have done. You know, we carted your body mind book from the beginning. It was just perfect. You know, it was on every reading list from the earliest massage classes that we taught or training group. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Ken. And thank you for all your support over the years.